Saturday, 6th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I put a letter in which I wrote what I explained to you yesterday in Daddy's pocket before supper yesterday. After reading it, he was, according to Margot, very upset for the rest of the evening. I was upstairs doing the dishes. Poor Pim, I might have known what the effect of such an epistle would be. He is so sensitive. I immediately told Peter not to ask or say anything more. Pim hasn't said any more about it to me. Is that yet in store, I wonder? Here, everything is going on more or less normally again. What they tell us about the prices and the people outside is almost unbelievable. Half a pound of tea costs 350 florins. A pound of coffee, 80 florins. Butter, 35 florins per pound. An egg, 1.45 florins. People pay 14 florins for an ounce of Bulgarian tobacco. Everyone deals in the black market. Every errand boy has something to offer. Our baker's boy got hold of some um, sewing silk for 0.9 florins for a thin little skin. The milkman manages to get clandestine ration cards. The undertaker delivers the cheese. Burglaries, murders, and theft go on daily. The police and night watchmen join in just as strenuously as the prof professionals. Everyone wants something in their empty stomachs, and because wage increases are forbidden, the people simply have to swindle. The police are continually on the go, tracing girls of 15, 16, 17, and older who are reported missing every day. Yours, Anne. Sunday morning, 7th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, Daddy and I had a long talk yesterday afternoon. I cried terribly, and he joined in. Do you know what he said to me, Kitty? I have received many letters in my life, but this is certainly the most unpleasant. You, Anne, who have received such love from your parents. You, who have parents who are always ready to help you, who are always defended you, when it, whatever it might be. Can you talk of feeling no responsibility towards us? You feel wronged and deserted. No, Anne, you have done us a great injustice. Perhaps you didn't mean it like that, but it was what you wrote. No, Anne, we haven't deserved such a reproach as this. Oh, I have failed miserably. This is certainly the worst thing I have ever done in my life. I was only trying to show off with my crying and my tears, just trying to appear big so that he would respect me. Certainly, I have had a lot of unhappiness, but to accuse the good Pim, who has done and still does do everything for me, no, that was too low for words. It's right that for once I've been taken down from my in inaccessible pedestal, that my pride has been shaken a bit, for I was becoming much too taken up with myself again. What Miss Anne does is by no means always right. Anyone who can cause such unhappiness to someone else Someone he professes to love, and on purpose, too, is low, very low. And the way Daddy has forgiven me makes me feel more than ever ashamed of myself. He is going to throw the letter in the fire and is so sweet to me now, just as if he had done something wrong. No, Anne, you still have a tremendous lot to learn. Begin by doing that first, instead of looking down on others and accusing them. I've had a lot of sorrow, but who hasn't at my age? I have played the clown a lot, too, but I was hardly conscious of it. I felt lonely, but hardly ever in despair. I ought to be deeply ashamed of myself, and indeed I am. What is done cannot be undone, but one can prevent it happening again. I want to start from the beginning again, and it can't be difficult, now that I have Peter. With him to support me, I can and will. I'm not alone any more. He loves me. I love him. I have my books, my storybook, and my diary. I'm not so frightfully ugly, not utterly stupid, have a cheerful temperament, and want to have a good character. Yes, and you felt deeply that your letter was too hard and that it was untrue. To think that you were even proud of it. I will take Daddy as my example, and I will improve. Yours, Anne. Monday, 8th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, have I ever told you anything about our family? I don't think I have, so I will begin now. My father's parents were very rich. His father had worked himself right up, and his mother came from a prominent family, who were also rich. 
So in his youth, Daddy had a real little rich boy's upbringing. Parties every week, balls, festivities, beautiful girls, dinners, a large home, etc., etc. After Grandpa's death, all the money was lost during the World War and the inflation that followed. Daddy was therefore extremely well brought up and he laughed very much yesterday when, for the first time in his 55 years, he scraped out the frying pan at the table. Mummy's parents were rich too, and we often listen open-mouthed to the stories of engagement parties of 250 people, private balls, and dinners. One certainly could not call us rich now, but all my hopes are pinned on after the war. I can assure you I'm not at all keen on a narrow, cramped existence like Mummy and Margot. I'd adore to go to Paris for a year and London for a year to learn the languages and study the history of art. Compare that with Margot, who wants to be a mid midwife in Palestine. I always long to see beautiful dresses and interesting people. I want to see something of the world and do all kinds of exciting things. I've already told you this before, and a little money as well won't do any harm. Meep told us this morning about a party she went to, to celebrate an engagement. Both the future bride and bridegroom came from rich families, and everything was very grand. Meep made our mouths water, telling us about the food they had. Vegetable soup with minced meatballs in it, cheese, rolls, hors d'oeuvres with eggs and roast beef, fancy cakes, wine, and cigarettes, as much as you wanted of everything, black market. Meep had ten drinks. Can that be the woman who calls herself a teetotaler? If Meep had all those, I wonder however many her spouse managed to knock back. Naturally, everyone at the party was a bit tipsy. There were two policemen from the fighting squad who took photos of the engaged couple. It seems as if we are never far from Meep's thoughts because she took down the address of these men at once, in case anything should happen at some time or other, and good Dutchmen might come in useful. She made our mouths water, we, who get nothing but two spoonfuls of porridge for our breakfast, and whose tummies were so empty that they were positively rattling, we, who get nothing but half-cooked spinach to preserve the vitamins, and rotten potatoes day after day, we, who get nothing but lettuce, cooked or raw, spinach, and yet again spinach in our hollow stomachs. Perhaps we may yet grow to be as strong as Popeye, although I don't see much sign of it at present. If Meep had taken us to the party, we shouldn't have left any rolls for the other guests. I can tell you, we positively drew the words from Meep's lips. We gathered round her as if we'd never heard about delicious food or smart people in our lives before. And these are the granddaughters of a millionaire. The world is a queer place. Yours, Anne. Tuesday, 9th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I finished my story of Ellen the Fairy. I have copied it out on nice note paper. It certainly looks very attractive, but it is really enough for Daddy's birthday? I don't know. Mummy and Margot have both written poems for him. Mr. Crawler came upstairs this afternoon with the news that Miss B, who used to act as a demonstrator for the businesses, wants to eat her box lunch in the office here at 2 o'clock every afternoon. Think of it. No one can come upstairs anymore. The potatoes cannot be delivered. Eli can't have any lunch. We can't go to the W.C. We mustn't move, etc., etc. We thought about up the wildest and most varied suggestions to wheedle her away. Van Dan thought a good laxative in her coffee would be sufficient. No, replied Kufus. I beg of you not. Then we'd never get her off the box. Resounding laughter. Off the box, asked Mrs. Van, Van Dan. What does that mean? An explanation followed. Can I always use it? She then asked stupidly, imagine it, Eli giggled. If one asked for the box in Bien Corfs, they wouldn't even understand what you mean. Oh, Kit, it's such wonderful weather. If only I could go outdoors. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, 10th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, we were sitting in the attic doing some French yesterday afternoon when I suddenly heard water pattering down behind me. I asked Peter what it could be. He didn't even reply, simply tore up the loft where the source of the disaster was and pushed Moshi, who, because of the wet earth box, had sat down beside it, harshly back to the right place. A great din and disturbance followed, and Moshi, who had finished by that time, dashed downstairs. 
Moshi, seeking the convenience of something familiar or similar to his box, had chosen some wood shavings. The pool had trickled down from the loft into the attic immediately, and unfortunately landed just beside and in the barrel of potatoes. The ceiling was dripping, and as the attic floor is not free from holes either, several yellow drips came through the ceiling into the dining room between a pile of stockings and some books, which were lying on the table. I was doubled up with laughter. It really was a scream. There was Moshi crouching under a chair, Peter with water, bleaching powder, and floor cloth and Van Dan trying to soothe everyone. The calamity was soon over, but it is well known fact that the cat's puddles positively stink. The potatoes proved this only too clearly, and also the wood shavings that Daddy collected in a bucket to be burned. Poor Moshi, how are you to know that Pete is unattainable? Yours, Anne. P.S. Our beloved queen spoke to us yesterday and this evening. She is taking a holiday in order to be strong for her return to Holland. She used words like soon, when I am back, speedy liberation, heroism, and heavy burdens. A speech, a speech by Gerbrandi followed. A clergyman concluded with a prayer to God to take care of the Jews, the people in concentration camps, in prisons, and in Germany. Yours, Anne. Thursday, 11th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, I'm frightfully busy at the moment, and although it sounds mad, I haven't time to get through my pile of work. Shall I tell you briefly what I have got to do? Well then, by tomorrow I must finish reading the first part of Galileo Galilei, as it has to be returned to the library. I only started it yesterday, but I shall manage. Next week, I have got to read Palestine, Palestine at the Crossroads, and the second part of Galilei. Next, I finished reading the first part of the biography of the Emperor Charles V yesterday, and it's essential that I work out all the diagrams and family trees that I have collected from it. After that, I have three pages of foreign words gathered from various books, which have all got to be recited, written down, and learned. Number four is that my film stars are all mixed up together and are simply gasping to be tidied up. However, as such a clearance would take several days, and since Professor Anne, as she's already said, is choked with work, the chaos will have to remain a chaos. Next, Theseus, Oedipus, Peleus, Orpheus, Jason, and Hercules are awaiting their turn to be arranged, as their different deeds lie crisscross in my mind like fancy threads in a dress. It's also high time Myron and Phidias had some treatment if they wish to remain at all coherent. Likewise, it's the same with the seven and nine years war. I'm mixing everything up together at this rate. Yes, but what can one do with such a memory? Think how forgetful I shall be when I'm eighty. Oh, something else, the Bible. How long is it still going to take before I'm meeting the bathing Susanna? And what do they mean by the guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah? Oh, there is still such a terrible lot to find out and to learn. And in the meantime, I have let Li Lizolette and Flaws completely in the lurch. Kitty, can you see that I'm just about bursting? Now, about something else. You've known for a long time that my greatest wish is to become a journalist someday, and later on, a famous writer. Whether these leanings towards greatness, or insanity, will ever materialize remains to be seen, but I certainly have the subjects in mind. In any case, I want to publish a book entitled Het Actrice After the War. Whether I shall succeed or not, I cannot say, but my diary will be a great help. I have other ideas as well, besides Het Actrice, but I will write more fully about them some other time, when they have taken a clearer form in my mind. Yours, Anne.